Chapter 13 Eugene V. Debs and Woodrow Wilson Socialist Words, Socialist Actions Guess what? President Woodrow Wilson presided over a socialist coup. The imposition of socialism in America, as elsewhere, was accompanied by war and domestic repression. Wilson's economic policies proved a total failure. Eugene V. Debs, five-time presidential candidate for the Socialist Democratic Party of America, labor radical and Pullman strike veteran, international workers of the world founder, began his career as a minor league terrorist and ended it as a martyr to the stupidity of Woodrow Wilson. Contra Marx, some stories are farce the first time around. Born in Indiana in 1855, Debs was a child of privilege, the son of a prosperous family of French immigrants. His father owned a textile mill and a grocery business. Debs himself gave in to his romantic strain early, leaving home at the age of fourteen and going to work for the railroad, first as a painter and later as a boiler man. Having exhausted that career and completed business school, he returned home to work in the grocery business and to dabble in labor radicalism, helping to found a local railroad union and becoming editor of its journal. He would use his newfound prominence as a labor activist and editor to get himself elected to the state legislature as a Democrat in 1884, serving a single term. All in all, it was not an unusual career for a progressive of his time. It was the bitter battle of the Pullman strike that would make a minor historical figure of Debs. When railroad profits plunged following the Panic of 1893, railroad operators responded by cutting wages inspiring a wildcat strike that began in Pullman, Illinois. Debs originally resisted the proposal for a mass action against the Pullman railroad car manufacturer. The company was strong, the unions were weak and disunited, and the prospects of success were slim. Further, Pullman cars carried the U.S. mail, and President Grover Cleveland was no fan of the burgeoning labor movement. Debs counseled prudence, but the rest of radicals who ran the labor movement were not inclined to listen. Like any good politician, Debs realized he had lost the argument and quickly calculated that if there was going to be a strike, he'd do well to get in front of the parade. Debs became the public face of the Pullman strike, and the campaign he had counseled against became known as Debs Rebellion. President Cleveland, citing the disruption of the mail, ordered an end to the strike, but the strikers refused. Cleveland sent in the army to enforce the federal injunction, and the ensuing clash resulted in the deaths of thirteen strikers. Hauled up on federal charges of contempt of court for failing to heed the injunction, Debs was shipped off to prison. At trial, he was represented by Clarence Darrow, a like-minded progressive with an enormous talent for self-promotion. Thus is history made. Debs, the socialist historian Howard Zinn writes with a good deal of glee, was met with the full force of the capitalist state in 1894, during his campaign against the Pullman Palace Car Company. In reality, Debs had been torching railroad cars, and punishing arson and the destruction of property is hardly an innovation of the capitalist state, dating back as it does to Hammurabi, at least. But socialists, as I have argued, are romantics. They will never let an inconvenient fact get in the way of a good rollicking denunciation. Debs's imprisonment was not exactly the stuff of romantic martyrdom. In an 1895 letter to his father, Debs showed himself full of self-righteous sentiment and utterly immune to irony. Even as the panic and the strike resulted in death, displacement, and massive economic suffering, Debs remained the cuddled teapot radical, writing, I have immense satisfaction in knowing that you and mother, notwithstanding your years, are as proud, heroic, and defiant as the rest of us. No disgrace attaches to the family. You need not blush. As for the conditions of his imprisonment, my jail quarters are large, airy, clean, and comfortable, and I am perfectly at home with the sheriff's family, whose residence adjoins the jail. Sunday, Charlie Gould was here, and we spent the afternoon in the sheriff's parlors, regaling ourselves, after a good dinner of stuffed roast chicken, with a musical concert. Saturday, Governor Waite of Colorado was with us from eleven till two, taking dinner with us. Debs thought of himself as a political prisoner and, self-consciously, as a hero. You and mother must carry yourselves like the Spartans of old. This is not the time for sighs of tears, 
but for heroic fortitude which does not waver, no matter how trying the ordeal. If the night is dark, the dawn is near. Our day is coming. It was, of course, not to be Debs's last experience of prison. President Wilson, with his contempt for civil liberties and his mania for centralizing both political and economic power, would see to that. Owning it. From the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, I am Bolshevik, and proud of it. Eugene Debs, 1919 Woodrow Wilson's Socialist Coup Outside of left-wing circles, Debs is now mostly forgotten, and it is certain that his obscurity would be even deeper than it is today if not for the fact that Woodrow Wilson persecuted him under the Espionage Act for his anti-war activities providing Debs with the opportunity of enacting a great drama, running his final presidential campaign from behind the prison's walls. As revolutionary careers go, it was not a great showing, but Debs remains the uncontested patron saint of American socialism, and his influence today remains lively in that camp. Dissent Magazine's 2010 Symposium on the Future of Socialism begins with a pin to Debs, written by Michael Kazin. The socialist movement is as wide as the world, Eugene V. Debs told the large crowds that came to hear him all over the United States. Its mission is to win the world, the whole world, from animalism and consecrate it to humanity. What a tremendous task, and what a royal privilege to share in it. The history of the twentieth century made such confidence quite impossible. Yet socialism still has meaning, even if that meaning probably has never been as murky as it is today. Conservatives brand Barack Obama a socialist for signing a national health care plan that Richard Nixon would have viewed as timid. The rulers of the most populous country on earth say their booming capitalist economy is somehow building socialism with Chinese characteristics, while the socialist parties of Europe struggle to prove they can spur economic growth while keeping their welfare states from going bankrupt. Kazin has a number of excellent points here, about Nixon, about China, and about Europe's socialist parties, though they are not the points he thinks. But before we examine that, note the extraordinarily sharp contrast between Debs's language and Kazin's. Though Kazin passes over it uncritically, Debs's words must sound, to the modern ear, a bit tinny and slightly saccharine. It is also Manichaean. He offers the audience a choice between animalism and his creed, which is consecrated to humanity whatever that may hope to mean. Kazin's language, on the other hand, is jaded, cynical, and skeptical. Socialism? he all but asks. You call this socialism? By those standards, Nixon was a socialist. As indeed he was, to a greater extent than either he or his admirers probably understood. Kazin's pose is part of a deliberate rhetorical strategy used by the left, in essence holding that anything short of Molotov cocktails in the street cannot possibly be regarded as real socialism. Richard Nixon would have done it. How could it possibly be socialist? Similar examples abound. Shortly after the passage of Senator Christopher Dodd's cumbrous financial reform bill, The Nation published a story under the headline, Is Dodd Bill Socialist? Don't Make Socialists Laugh. Mockery, of course, is a cheap substitute for argument. Mikhail Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, was unquestionably a true-believing socialist. We have his word and his record on that. But Gorbachev decontrolled wages and many prices. Richard Nixon enacted wage and price controls, attempting to micromanage the U.S. economy from Washington. China, for all its export-driven private fortunes and its nouveau riche tycoons in their shiny new Buicks, remains very much a command-and-control economy, with government central planners in charge of both the commanding heights of the economy and street-level bureaucracy. The European socialist parties, encumbered as they are by economic realities, still work consistently for greater consolidation of economic power in political hands, as indeed does the European Union. Kazin scoffs at these things as weak tea examples of socialism. That is because he has paid too much heed to the words of Eugene Debs, but not enough to the actions of Debs's nemesis, Woodrow Wilson. Debs gave great speeches about socialism. Wilson set about building the machinery of American socialism. Debs did not get on the outs with Wilson because Debs was anti-capitalism. 
Wilson put Debs in prison because Debs campaigned against the war that Wilson required to build his central planning regime, the war socialism that accompanied American entry into World War I. It may be a genuine ideological lacunae, or it may be simple willfulness, but the American left cannot bring itself to identify a socialist unless he first identifies himself as a socialist, and even then they may demur. Kazan apparently believes that the Politburo of the People's Republic of China and the highest echelons of China's Communist Party do not qualify as socialists, their own protestations to the contrary. But socialism rarely comes in the form of peasants with pitchforks, and it certainly never stays there. Most of the very committed socialist regimes that the world has experienced have come to power either through civil wars or wars of nationalism, and the belligerents' aims were typically not explicitly socialist. Where socialism has been imposed through democratic and quasi-democratic means, the process has been still less dramatic. The socialists of Western Europe, for example, have had little of Eugene Debs about them, preferring technocratic jargon to his messianic rhetoric. It is difficult to imagine a Mitterrand exclaiming that he was to be baptized in socialism in the roar of conflict. In the gleam of every bayonet and the flash of every rifle, the class struggle was revealed. That's the stuff of adolescent rebellion and sophomore themes about the Abraham Lincoln brigades. Socialism in the United States is a romantic phenomenon and a reactionary one as well. So focused are American progressives on romantic figures such as Debs that they fail to see the socialists in front of their faces, central planners like Wilson and Nixon. Of course, there are few political movements that would be eager to claim Nixon, understandably. Wilson, to the extent that his legacy is embraced by neoconservatives, is admired for the energy of his foreign policy and not for his centralizing ambitions at home. It is a conservative blind spot that many on the right fail to see how those two policies are linked. Wilson was president of the United States, and a wartime president at that, hardly the sort of thing that appeals to an American left that is more Berkeley than Bolshevik. Debs, on the other hand, was a martyr to free speech, a rare American martyr to free speech. If American progressives desire more such martyrs, the socialist world has provided millions of examples, many of them buried in unmarked mass graves. Debs talked about socialism. Wilson put it into action. As Robert Higgs documents in his magisterial Crisis and Leviathan, the war saw rapid growth and consolidation of federal power, along with the political suppression that inevitably follows. Eugene Debs was hardly the only victim of the Wilson administration. Despite expansion during Woodrow Wilson's first term as president, the federal government on the eve of World War I remained small. In 1914, federal spending totaled less than 2% of GNP. The top rate of the recently enacted federal individual income tax was 7% on income over $500,000, and 99% of the population owed no income tax. The 402,000 federal civilian employees, most of whom worked for the post office, constituted about 1% of the labor force. With U.S. entry into the Great War, the federal government expanded enormously in size, scope, and power. It virtually nationalized the ocean shipping industry. It did nationalize the railroad, telephone, domestic telegraph, and international telegraphic cable industries. It became deeply engaged in manipulating labor management relations, securities sales, agricultural production and marketing, the distribution of coal and oil, international commerce, and markets for raw materials and manufactured products. Its liberty bond drives dominated the financial capital markets. It turned the newly created Federal Reserve System into a powerful engine of monetary inflation to help satisfy the government's voracious appetite for money and credit. In view of the more than 5,000 mobilization agencies of various sorts, boards, committees, corporations, administrations, contemporaries who described the 1918 government as war socialism were well justified. Wilson, in short, enacted a socialist coup, one with very little bloodshed, but by no means none at all. Of course, such projects are monstrously expensive. Taxes were increased enormously, and federal revenue rose fourfold in two years. Debt exploded as well, as Higgs reports, with the national debt swelling from just over $1 billion to more than $25 billion. Complaining about the new taxes, or anything else for that matter, was robustly discouraged. According to Higgs, 
To ensure that the conscription-based mobilization could proceed without obstruction, critics had to be silenced. The Espionage Act of June 15, 1917, penalized those convicted of willfully obstructing the enlistment services by fines up to $10,000 and imprisonment as long as 20 years. An amendment, the Sedition Act of May 16, 1918, went much further, imposing the same severe criminal penalties on all forms of expression in any way critical of the government, its symbols, or its mobilization of resources for the war. Those suppressions of free speech, subsequently upheld by the Supreme Court, established dangerous precedents that derogated from the rights previously enjoyed by citizens under the First Amendment. The government further subverted the Bill of Rights by censoring all printed materials, peremptorily deporting hundreds of aliens without due process of law, and conducting and encouraging state and local governments and vigilante groups to conduct warrantless searches and seizures, blanket arrests of suspected draft evaders, and other outrages too numerous to catalog here. In California, the police arrested Upton Sinclair for reading the Bill of Rights at a rally. In New Jersey, the police arrested Roger Baldwin for publicly reading the Constitution. The government also employed a massive propaganda machine to whip up what can only be described as public hysteria. The result was countless incidents of intimidation, physical abuse, and even lynching of persons suspected of disloyalty or insufficient enthusiasm for the war. People of German ancestry suffered disproportionately. I am an advocate of peace, Wilson wrote, but there are some splendid things that come to a nation through the discipline of war. The pattern would inevitably be repeated during the next great war. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, in the early days of fascism, expressed his admiration for Mussolini and his system. He would also cite Wilson's War Socialism as a model for his response to the Great Depression and the economic regimentation that took place during World War II. With his court-packing scheme and his general contempt for constitutional limits on executive power, Roosevelt is a problematic figure. But Wilson stands alone and uncontested as being the nearest thing to a Lenin or a Mussolini that the United States has yet endured. Predictably, Wilson's campaign to bring regimentation and central planning to the U.S. economy resulted in massive failure, and, just as Stalin and Mao would do in their time, and Castro and Chavez in theirs, Wilson blamed his failures on defeatists, traitors, and saboteurs in our midst. Dozens of newspapers and magazines were shut down by the federal government, critics were thrown in jail under the Sedition Act, and mobs mobilized to intimidate and assault particularly unwelcome critics. Wilson paid particular interest to immigrants, whom he distrusted as insufficiently loyal to the United States. The gravest threats against our national peace and safety have been uttered within our own borders, Wilson told a congressional audience. There are citizens of the United States, I blush to admit, born under other flags, who have poured the poison of disloyalty into the very arteries of our national life, who have sought to bring the authority and good name of our government into contempt, to destroy our industries wherever they thought it effective for their vindictive purposes. Wilson's propaganda and intimidation campaign would reach its zenith when he turned to a bona fide socialist, journalist George Creel, to run his Gestapo-like operations. As Fred Siegel documents, Wilson placed George Creel, a journalist, socialist, and strong supporter of child labor laws and women's suffrage, in charge of ensuring home front morale through the Committee for Public Information. But the committee, which Creel described as the world's greatest adventure in advertising, wildly overshot its mark, encouraging the banning of everything German, from Beethoven to sauerkraut to teaching the German language. The Justice Department and the Attorney General, Thomas Gregory, encouraged local vigilantism against Germans, giving the American Protective League, a quarter of a million strong nativist organization, semi-official status to spy on those suspected of disloyalty. The League went out of its way to break up labor strikes as well, while branding its critics Reds. Responding to the League's excesses, Wilson declared that he'd rather the blamed place should be blown up than persecute innocent people. But in the next breath he said, Woe be to the man or group of men that seeks to stand in our way. Despite his misgivings, Wilson deferred to Gregory's judgment and refrained from taking action against extremists. Only after the armistice ended the war in November 1918 did Wilson, 
heeding the advice of incoming Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, moved to end government cooperation with the League. But by now, the disparity between Wilson's call for extending liberty abroad and the suppression of liberty at home had become a running sore for disenchanted progressives. With its hostility toward foreigners, its distrust of private enterprise, its centralizing ambitions, and its allegedly rational managerial style, Wilson's war socialism long survived the Great War and its immediate aftermath. It was always intended to. The socialist philosopher Otto Neurath, a contemporary of Hayek's and Mises, was at the time of Wilson's ascent making a study of war socialism and considering the prospects for extending its rigors once the war ended. As Bruce Caldwell reports in his invaluable Hayek and Socialism, before World War I, Neurath began to make a reputation as a proponent of a new academic subfield, war economy. He also participated, along with Mises, in Ugen von Bomberwerk's famous economic seminar. Among the other seminar participants were Joseph Schumpeter, Otto Bauer, who would lead the Austrian Socialist Democratic Party in the 1920s, and Rudolf Hilferding, one of the leading Marxian theoreticians of the 20th century. According to Neurath, during peacetime, production in market economies is driven by the search for profits, but this leads to recurrent periods of overproduction and unemployment. In wartime, by contrast, production is no longer driven by profit-seeking, and the war effort ensures that productive capacity is always fully utilized. Another characteristic of the war economy is the suppression of the price system, which is replaced by extensive planning of materials management from the center. This is all to the good, because for Neurath, the monetary system, the search for profits, and the disorderliness of capitalist production all go hand in hand. Neurath argued that the central planning that emerges within war economies should continue in peacetime. He proposed that a natural accounting center be set up to run the economy as if it were one giant enterprise, or, as Mussolini put it, everything in the state, nothing outside the state. I'm sensing a theme here. Men are as clay in the hands of the consummate leader. Woodrow Wilson The world is not looking for servants, there are plenty of these, but for masters, men who form their purposes and then carry them out, let the consequences be what they may. Woodrow Wilson The Rotten Fruits of War Socialism That line of thinking will, by this point, be entirely familiar. The notion that profits and costs associated with them, such as marketing budgets and high levels of executive compensation, represent waste, still is very much with us. It has been a cornerstone of the socialists' argument in the health care reform debate, as well as in the financial industry reform debate. The writers at Dissent, for example, call for the construction of a public utility finance system on the assumption that the lack of profits and a profit motive will make the system more efficient, despite generations' worth of experience that such systems are less efficient. Likewise, the low overhead of the Medicare system was used to argue that a government-run health care system will be more efficient than a privately run system, taking little or no account for the explicit and implicit subsidies enjoyed by Medicare, not the least of which is that it uses the IRS as its bill collector. One big factory was Lenin's description of the ideal socialist economy, just as one big union was the IWW's ideal. And if the economy is one big factory with one big workforce, then there is, in fact, no need for money and all that goes along with it. Goods may be distributed directly to consumers on an as-needed basis. Neurath foresaw that development as well, Caldwell reports. Most controversially, he insisted that money would be unnecessary in the new planned order, because production would be driven by objectively determined needs, rather than by the search for profits. All calculation regarding the appropriate levels of inputs and output could be handled in natural physical terms. In Neurath's opinion, attempts to employ monetary calculations within a planned society would render impossible scientific economic management, which had to be conducted in terms of real physical quantities. Objectively determined needs, rather than the search for profits. There's a reason that may sound familiar from the U.S. health care reform debate. It might also be restated, from each according to his ability, 
to each according to his needs, as objectively determined by the appropriate planner. President Obama and his Secretary of Health and Human Services regularly denounced the health care industry's profits, particularly insurance profits, during the debate over reform. Clumsily, in a major speech on the issue, Obama also blamed high health care costs on excessive profits at a number of firms he apparently had not been informed are non-profit. This is an old complaint, and yet one that is as fresh as today's headlines. In the United States, health care is a big business commodity with a big price tag, comprising 14% of the U.S. GNP. Removing profit from the Wall Street-controlled health industry can fully fund a system that puts health before profit. That's from the 2010 party program of the Communist Party of the United States of America, whose vision we will revisit later, but it could as easily have come from the mouth of Barack Obama or Nancy Pelosi. For our current purposes, it is sufficient to note that all the central planners, from Marx himself to Lenin to Wilson's rationalizers to the CPUSA to the healthcare crusaders, see profit as something extraneous and exogenous to the economy by which we mean the process by which goods and services are created, developed, and delivered. Profit, under all these models, inhibits efficiency and the rational distribution of goods, services, and capital. The truth is precisely the opposite. The search for profit and the competition it leads to are what create efficiency and police the rational deployment of resources. Wilson's war planners bragged that they had outlawed 250 types of plows and 755 types of drills in their campaign to strip from trade and industry the lumber of futile custom and the encrustation of useless variety, as though one plow were the right plow for every field, as though one drill were the right drill for every hole. The welter of choices produced by capitalism, 900 kinds of shampoo in your local Walmart, are not waste. They are the price paid for innovation. But the one-drill-size-fits-all mentality is natural to the central planner who mistakes standardization for rational order and who sees the nearly infinite variety of goods produced by capitalism as frivolous. This mania for uniformity and political conformity defined the corporate culture of Wilson's War Industries Board, the main central planning agency implementing his regimentation of the economy. The WIB held sway over virtually the entire U.S. economy. An important exception to WIB domination was the food industry, which was governed by the one-man autocracy, autocrat was, in fact, the term employed, of Herbert Hoover, who ran the Food Administration. Hoover, inaccurately characterized by the FDR political machine, and subsequently by historians, as a laissez-faire market fundamentalist, never lost the taste for governmental macroeconomic management, and his interventionist policies, incubated in Wilson's war socialism, helped to deepen the Depression years later. The WIB's executives sought ever more dictatorial powers for themselves. Judge Albert Gary, president of U.S. Steel, was given the portfolio of National Steel Czar and demanded that he and his steel industry cronies be given plenipotentiary powers, if necessary to commandeer the resources of recalcitrant steel producers, including the smaller and more nimble competitors of U.S. Steel. But for the most part, no such dictatorial powers were required. Just as the Obama administration bought off the health insurance industry, assuaging their resistance to the quasi-nationalization of American health care with a mandate that every American buy what the insurance industry is selling, Wilson's WIB rationalized American industry by promising to lock in what were at the time high profits. Production, wages, prices, and profits were to be coordinated by the leaders of industry themselves, acting under the auspices of the government. In other words, Wilson's war socialism allowed the captains of industry to do what they had wanted to do all along, to collude against their smaller competitors, but had been prohibited from doing by antitrust laws. It was not for nothing that Adam Smith wrote that people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public, or in some contrivance to raise prices. The romantic notion of politics holds that big business is synonymous with capitalism and the archenemy of socialism. In fact, big business is reliably against most of what must go into any modern definition of capitalism, free trade, free enterprise, free markets, and the impartial rule of law. 
Big business reliably seeks to use the state to seek advantages in trade and to crush smaller and often more innovative competitors. Big business loved Wilson's war socialism, just as ensconced industrial interests would back the national socialisms of Mussolini and Hitler. If Russia had had much of an industrial economy, it is likely that its industrialists would have sought to reach an accommodation with the central planners, just as China's industrialists today are the most perfervid supporters of single-party autocratic rule under the communists. But if you're going to be Mussolini, you have to make the trains run on time. How did Wilson's war socialism perform? In one important way, it performed much like Soviet socialism. The Soviet Union did not achieve much in the way of long-term material improvements for the Russian people or their vanquished neighbors, but it did achieve massive radical industrialization at unprecedented speed. Wilson's war socialism had a similar outcome and employed similar, though not identical, techniques. Lenin and Stalin had their campaigns of forced collectivization and massive internal displacements. Wilson had the draft, which expanded the pre-war army of 174,000 to a force that eventually sent nearly five million Americans to war as active soldiers. Furthermore, through the WIB, he drafted the entire economy into what Dwight D. Eisenhower would later describe, ominously, as the military-industrial complex, a term of which Wilson and his central planners certainly would have approved. In the end, war socialism proved itself a terrible investment. Although U.S. industrial production grew 39% between 1916 and 1918, a remarkable feat, it came at a huge cost. Federal spending skyrocketed from $1.3 billion in 1916 to $15.5 billion in 1918. Even as the war wound down, federal spending remained high, $12.4 billion in 1919, $5.7 billion in 1920, figures in constant 1916 dollars. Inflation was rapid and brutal. Setting aside the horrific human toll of the war, which was a domestic cultural catastrophe as well, ratifying the reach of a limitless federal leviathan, those economic gains amounted to nowhere near the real economic costs of the war. Modern warfare is usually a net economic loss to all players, but that was especially obvious in the case of the Great War and American War Socialism. Such gains as there were proved transitory, in spite of the central planner's bare-knuckled campaign to hold on to their temporary war powers after the war ended, to make wartime necessity a matter of peacetime advantage, as one contemporary observer put it. By 1920, industrial output had radically contracted, returning close to its 1916 levels. Federal revenues continued to set records, but federal spending, unbelievably to the modern reader, was cut by more than half in a sober effort to pay down the war debts, a burden made somewhat easier by the fact that the United States, by financing much of the Allied war effort, emerged from the conflict a net creditor nation. The real GNP of the United States grew from $46 billion in 1916 to $49.6 billion at the height of the war, but by 1920 it fell back to nearly its pre-war level, declining to $47 billion. All that spending, killing, and regimentation had bought the country, under the most charitable interpretation of the economic data, an extra $1 billion in GNP, at a cost equivalent to $7 trillion in 2010 dollars. There is a good deal of controversy about whether America's entry into that war served the national interest, but there is no question that the war and Wilson's war socialism were an enormous net economic loss, and the massive misallocation of capital created by Wilson's policies created deep economic imbalances that would make themselves painfully manifest in the Great Depression a decade and a half later. Most important, Wilson's war socialism also failed on its own terms. Those gross industrial production numbers are indeed impressive, but a closer look at the data suggests that production was unreliable and erratic. Well into the war, a war in which America was involved for only 19 months, U.S. troops still were going into battle with French artillery because the American munitions industry, the ne plus ultra of war socialism, could not provide our soldiers with sufficient weaponry. And the losses, of course, were not limited to war expenditures— the real cost of Wilsonian war socialism must include the opportunity costs of all the gains that were foregone by the WIB's mismanagement of the economy, 
by its encouragement of cartelization and price-fixing among major industrial interests, and by setting a precedent for radical federal intervention in the private economy, a precedent that would come back to repeatedly haunt the United States in the Great Depression, in World War II, during the Nixon-Carter years, and during the financial crisis of 2008. Not a good legacy. The blunt fact is that when under Wilson America was introduced to the war state in 1917, it was introduced also to what would later be known as the total or totalitarian state. Robert Nisbet, 1988 This ends badly. With pride and joy we watch each advancing step of our comrades in socialism in all other lands, our hearts are with them in their varying fortunes as the battle proceeds, and we applaud each telling blow delivered and cheer each victory achieved. Eugene Debs, 1900, mourning the death of German communist leader Wilhelm Lee, death of Germanicht.